everyone. Today, I actually wanted to do something more random for a change, instead of just the usual progression of topics that I'm still generally sticking to, at least still for now. The timing of this video, to me, just felt like a good opportunity to talk about this type of thing because, as you'll see, not only is this just a cool concept in general to explore on the guitar, but I also think this could be something that can really demonstrate well a valuable musical lesson when it comes to making continuous growth as a musician over time. And it's the type of thing that I think could be good to keep in mind when I say some of the things I'm going to be talking about in the next episode. So. I'll elaborate on all that later in the video, but for now, I just want you to enjoy this concept on its own. So, the basic idea behind this concept is actually pretty straightforward. All it really is, is the utilization and exploration of what would be these consistently two note per string fingerings for mostly the major scale, but really for any seven note scale or tonality that you may think of or like to play. So this can also apply to scales like harmonic minor, melodic minor, harmonic major, whatever, but it has to be a seven note scale in order to really get, you know, what I'm getting out of this. So to give you a basic example of this, say we take a scale like C major, if I was going to start on C, the root of that scale, and start over here on the eighth fret of the low E string, we may get a fingering like this if we restrict ourselves to two notes per string. Now, I'm not going to focus too much in this video on like the fundamentals and the practicing of this scale or the other possible positions, but I'll run through them really quickly for you here and I'll let you know that I made a PDF of this. I basically worked out seven different fingerings of the major scale. You can kind of think of them like the seven different modes, but if you know your theory, you should know that any of these, you know, fingerings or positions could be utilized as any of the modes of a major scale. It really depends on the context in which you're using it. But I made a PDF that has all seven of the fingerings in the key of C major, and it could be really useful, you know, if you want to practice these with a little bit of consistency to get them in your hands. It's obviously going to make everything easier when you go to apply them. And plus, it's like, come on, where else are the specific diagrams of these fingerings going to be so readily available? And for only $2 on my website. Or you could just go to my Patreon and get all the PDFs on this channel for only $5 a month, but I'm just saying. All right, so if I were to run through those, I'd start with the same one, you know, starting on C. All right, and I'll start on D. It can almost be like Dorian. All right, next one, starting on E. Then starting on F, like a Lydian. Okay, then we got G, fifth degree. Okay, then we got A, like an Aeolian. Finally, starting on B. I guess your Lofian or whatever. Right, keep in mind, like I'm labeling these modally just because I don't know what else to label them. But again, that's just a label. It doesn't mean I'm necessarily using any of these in any of those contexts. But those are the fingerings or what would be the seven positions, I guess, for these two note per string fingerings for just the major scale. So as far as my influences go when it comes to this type of thing, this is something that I've heard one of my biggest guitar mentors, Rodney Jones, talk about sometimes. I know that he likes to use this type of thing and the results he gets out of it. And I'm certain there's a lot of other players who may be utilizing these types of fingerings and the ideas that might come with them as well, but I don't want to confirm any of them for you. Sometimes I feel like I can hear this type of thing in some of George Benson's playing, but it could be something to listen out for now. But as far as my own experience, I've only recently been experimenting with this type of thing and I've just been kind of figuring it out on my own and going on my own instinct. Now that I've been playing around with this type of thing for a little bit, I could say that so far the main reason I really seem to be into this has to do with the 
effect that it seems to have on things like my feel and my phrasing on certain lines and the way it makes them sound. Another obvious benefit that we can get out of this sort of thing is the fact that it can very easily break us out of positions, obviously, if we feel like we're restricted to different positions sometimes, because obviously when we're restricting ourselves to two notes per string consistently, we're going to have to move around the fretboard to keep the consistency going of an ascending scale or whatever. And, you know, that type of thing has never really been an issue for me. I never really had a problem or felt like I was, like, stuck to one position when it comes to my playing or my improvisation or whatever. But, obviously, we can't ignore that benefit as well. So, when it comes to the unique effect that these fingerings can have on things like our phrasing and feel, I think this is something that a lot of guitar players may possibly be more familiar with than they think. And that's because it's pretty conventional for us to already be utilizing two note per string fingerings for pentatonic scales on the guitar with the classic five positions or fingerings that we all usually learn early on. We just don't realize what may actually be unique about the sound of these consistent fingerings because it's always been the norm and what we're used to hearing, generally speaking. Of course, these five positions are also related to the five positions or fingerings of the major scale and all this is connected to the cage system of organization on the guitar. With the pentatonics, we're just leaving out the last two remaining notes of the more complete seven-note scale or tonality, but the set of five fingerings for each of these scales is still based on the same form or shape, essentially. And the main reason why these fingerings are so often taught and utilized is because they still do a really good job of comfortably keeping us in one position at a time, generally speaking, whenever we're going to go play something. And in an overall sense, that's still a very good thing to have. We just got lucky with the fingerings for the pentatonic scale working out to being a consistent two note per string while still always remaining in position. But the inevitability of this is usually almost an afterthought. It was only after I did the unconventional and tried working out seven note scales with consistent two note per string fingerings that I was able to realize what that was actually doing for the sound of the notes, whatever they were. What it comes down to is by making it a priority to consistently have the same number of notes on each string, in this case an even two, we create a rhythmic pattern since we're repeating the same innate kind of phrasing or articulation that we just naturally get by having two notes per string on every string. Essentially, it creates a sort of musical motif on the subtle level of articulation that could be sensed by the ears. And this is before even considering anything else that may be related to the phrasing of the notes, such as something like picking every note versus using hammer-ons and pull-offs and things like that. The sheer quantity of notes on each string alone can have a significant impact on the sound of them, and it's actually pretty fascinating when you think about it. I'm going to show you some of this stuff now using the examples that I was playing with in the opening clip of this video. The tune that I was applying this stuff to is Little Melanie by the great Jackie McLean. The basic changes for this tune are really cool and I thought they were good for trying to work out some of this stuff over. So the changes for the A section of this tune are actually pretty simple, especially when it's open and, you know, in the solo sections. It's just four bars of B7 sharp 11, and then generally four bars of like a B flat minor or B flat, you know, Dorian, just B flat minor, right? So let's start with the B7 sharp 11. Now the perfect scale that goes along with that is Lydian dominant. So I showed you the major scales before. This one translates over to the regular mix of Lydian. It's basically like a variation of that. All right. So if I were to play this scale in two note per string, you get something like this. Right. And that's on the downbeat right there. Uh, I like it on the upbeat. I'll show you that in a second. But if I were to compare that to the regular sort of cage position of that. Right, get up to that note versus. Uh, right, I'm trying to exaggerate it for you, but you know, I don't know how well the sort of feel of it or the sound of the feel translates over video, but hopefully you can tell that there's already a difference in that, all right? But like I said before, 
this actually sounds really cool to me, this whole concept, when I start on the upbeat with the same thing, starting on the first note on the string. So if I go one, two, three, four, one. That's what I did, something like that in the beginning. You know, I kind of just ended it with a nice little musical phrase that's not just going up the scale, but that just sounds really good to me. Right, again, if I were to compare that to a cage, Two, three, four. You know. Hopefully you can hear the pattern in that, all right? I kind of compare it to, you know, when people are learning saxophone and you're just practicing like your eighth notes or whatever, they talk about having this sort of articulation pattern where maybe you articulate the upbeats, but there's an evenness to it, all right? So I don't exactly know quite what I'm talking about when it comes to saxophone, but I think we're kind of creating a similar sort of situation here when we're playing two notes per string, all right? So, you know, if I go to the next chord, like a B-flat minor, uh, I did something like this. It's one of the fingerings, you know? You could say starting on the third degree, which would be like C Phrygian, but it's the same thing. Just end with an arpeggio, but versus it doesn't have that same feel, you know. Versus two notes. I also was doing this starting on the B flat note itself. It would basically be the position before the last one I did something like you know, right? If I did that in caged. Um, you know, so hopefully you can hear the difference. Now, when we get to the bridge of this tune, it's a pretty standard bridge. The first four bars are a minor 2-5 in the key of G minor, and then this tonic minor chord here, this G, then becomes a 2 chord in the key of F major because we're doing a 2-5. I think it's minor, but both work in the key of F major, right? So. For the first minor 2-5 in uh, G minor, I think I play a line like this. Right? And all I'm doing there is ascending like an F mixolydian. That's diatonically related to, you know, like A locrian, which, you know, that's the scale for like a half diminished chord there, right? So I'm just thinking of it here as F mixolydian since I'm starting on F, and this is one of those same seven positions. I'm just starting on the A string, but I'm basically going. And then when I get here, I'm in the next bar on the D7, it's the sharp nine, so I just do something like, right? And it sounds great. Right? It's really cool to notice, you know, even though I'm kind of variating these at the end of the phrase, it, from just ascending in a single direction, but a large part of these phrases for now, I'm literally just ascending a scale. And, you know, when you're learning about phrasing and trying to be creative and make lines, people will usually say, you know, that's not what you want to do. It's not just about playing scales up and down, but something like this really does go to show you that oftentimes it's not always just about what you play, but more importantly, oftentimes how you play something, right? So then, you know, the last two, five, um, I think I was thinking of it all like just like a C7, like C7 altered, which is kind of like, you know, the same thing as D flat melodic minor. So if I'm kind of thinking D flat, I think I did something like that. I'm just kind of thinking like a D flat scale, maybe D flat melodic minor. Yeah, right? And then I just kind of ended the line. Sorry. Something like a... Something like that, right? But you get the idea. So before I wrap this up, I'll remind you that I thought that there was, you know, a good lesson that we can take out of a concept like this. And I want you to keep in mind that in the next episode, Hope you're ready for the next episode. Hey. I'm going to be going back to the usual progression of topics and I'm going to be talking about the basic differences that I see between how I'll work on linear single note melodic material from a technical point of view versus any sort of chordal material. And if you've seen my videos on how I generally like to go about practicing the linear material from a technical perspective, you may know that a lot of it involves working a lot of the material through the fingerings of the cage system as best as I can and moving it around. So 
clearly, you know, anything that I may play within these two note per string fingerings is, you know, an exception to that and not what I normally do. The important takeaway here is that the only reason why I'm even able to appreciate a cool concept like this is because I allowed myself to not get too attached to my own dogma or my own approaches and what I think really works and everything because I think that oftentimes when people are learning something they can get really caught up and attached to their beliefs and it can potentially limit you from you know considering other possibilities or ways of doing things and you're limiting your potential to grow musically you know as time goes on. I think another example of something like this would be you know when people are learning stuff about harmony and they're learning about you know scales, chords, arpeggios, triads, whatever you know you might have people that are really into learning triads and I love triads too I love it all you know there's a lot of great things to get out of you know restricting yourself to triads for example but you could potentially get really caught up in your ways and you know limit yourself from seeing cool things that you can do from even you know working with scales because I think this is something that is really unique to like a seven note scale. So I know I'm rambling a little bit now about this point, but you should really appreciate this lesson as well. And remember to never get too attached to any, you know, sort of belief or approach, even if it is consistently working really well for you. But anyway, I'm just going to leave it there for today. So if anyone has any questions or anything they want to say, feel free to put it in the comments. I'm here to help. And that's it. So. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you gave it a like and consider becoming a subscriber. If you're new to the channel, my name is Derek Plavin and this is basically like a free online jazz guitar course that generally tries to progress in a logical manner. So if you want to get the most out of this channel, I would recommend going back to the beginning and watching at least the first three or four episodes just to see what they're all about and then you could take it from there and I'm also available for private lessons and have a lot of available accompanying PDFs to go along with a lot of videos on this channel like this one today and information for all this stuff is available on my website as well as my Patreon so make sure to check all that out and I will see you guys in episode 81 Swinging Every and playing the blues <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we're about I try to help you